Good afternoon. My topic today is titled Empirical Method to Measure Alveolar Bone Root Coverage of Single Rooted Teeth Using Cone Beam CT. My name is Jeffrey Miller. I graduated from Towson University, did my dental school training at University of Maryland. I got my orthodontic certificate at SUNY Buffalo, and I've been in private practice for just over 31 years. When we talk about cone beam CT, we're really talking about the ability to look at objects in three dimensions or three planes of space and the ability to eliminate the superimposed structures so we have a clearer view of what we're interested in. But mainly is we need to think in terms of three dimensions. We tend as orthodontists to favor the sagittal view because that's what we're used to looking at. We're all used to measuring cephalometric x-rays and looking at that sagittal view. But in fact, the other views can be just as important. The method we use to measure the amount of bone coverage that surrounds the root of a, of a tooth incorporates all three planes of space. We use the coronal, sagittal, and axial. The tooth is broken up into three zones. Uh, you have the no bone zone, which is the area of the tooth that has no bone coverage around the root. It's from the CEJ to the highest crestal bone, either measured from the, the sagittal or the coronal view. Then we have the partial bone zone. Normally teeth, especially the lower incisors, have a, a little bit higher level of bone on the lingual than they will on the facial and that is uh, taken in consideration. And then below the partial bone zone, we have an area we call the full bone zone, and that's the area of the root that's considered to be completely covered with bone. Now there are exceptions. You could have a small fenestration at the apex of the root, and that wouldn't be measured using this method. The, there are four measurements taken using this method, you have the root length, which is the CEJ to the apex. You have the highest vertical bone height, which is the highest crestal bone, uh, either taken from the sagittal or the coronal view, to the apex of the, of the root. Then we have the lowest vertical bone height. If you see in this example here, the facial bone is a little lower than the lingual bone. You can see it in the, in the radiograph uh, here. And we take the lowest vertical bone height, which is either the lowest height, either from the sagittal or coronal view, to the apex of the root. And then what we'll do is take the midpoint of the partial bone zone, take a slice through exactly the midpoint perpendicular to the facial axis or the long axis of the tooth, and then we'll measure the degrees of defect, the amount of the root circumference at that slice that's missing bone. So in this case, you would draw a, an angle from here to the center of the tooth to here, and that would give you the degrees of defect. You subtract, subtract the de degrees from defect from 360, and that gives you the degrees of coverage. And you divide that by 360 and multiply it by 100%. And it gives you percentage of that root that's covered with bone in that, on that, in that particular slice. Now, there is some burnout using cone beam CT. You can get burnout of some of the cortical bone. But usually, you're comparing teeth within the same arch. So they would each have that same relative uh, to each other. They would have the same amount of burnout. So the measurement, I think, still is valid. And then ultimately, you come up with a total root bone coverage. It's an empirical formula. It's a percent of the root that's covered with bone. And most of the studies I've seen, they use a sagittal view and they measure the thickness of the alveolar bone on the facial and lingual surface. And that, that's a that different kind of thing. This, this is using all three planes of space, and it's just telling you if the root has bone coverage as seen on a cone beam CT. It doesn't take into account the thickness. It also assumes that the, the root is a, a round circle, 360, and of course we know that's not the case. 
Uh, but I think in terms of a method, it gives you a relative brute bone coverage uh, for individual te teeth. And for example, if you're trying to make a strategic extraction decision, you can use this method and compare several teeth within the same mouth. Uh, I'm going to show you how it's done. Uh, using, this is using the CareStream uh, uh, software. We use the oblique slicing tab. The reason we use the oblique slicing tab is because it's very, very simple to get all the measurements either perpendicular or parallel to the long axis of the tooth. Uh, we're going to look at the upper right first by cuspid. And you can see from the axial view, you can see we're straight down, uh, we're looking straight down the long axis of the tooth. From the uh, coronal view, you see these lines were exactly parallel or perpendicular. This represents the halfway point of the partial bone zone, it's perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth. All the measurements have to be taken either perpendicular or parallel to the long axis or facial axis of the tooth, or else you're going to get vari variations. And here is from the sagittal view, you can see we're straight down the long axis of the tooth and perpendicular to the long axis here for the partial bone zone measurement. We use this little ruler over here on the left. It's very, very simple. Now I normally make the measurements right on top of the tooth, but just to show you here, I'm doing it parallel to the tooth so you can see a little better. So this is the root length from the apex to the CEJ comes out to 16 millimeters. Next measurement is the highest vertical bone height, uh, either from the coronal or sagittal view. In this case, it's from the apex, so highest bone height, which is right about here, and that's 15.4 millimeters. Then we have the lowest vertical bone height, which it looks like it's right about here, and that's 9.9 .9 millimeters. We take a uh, a measurement halfway between the part uh, the lowest vertical bone height and the highest vertical bone height and that's where we take a slice perpendicular to the long axis we use this angular measurement device and we we do three clicks one two three that gives us the degrees of de defect for that first bicuspid and in this case it's 51 degrees so we subtract 51 through from 360 divided by 360 times 100%, and that's 86%. That means, assuming this tooth is a round circle, it's covered, 86% of that tooth is covered by bone. And you could have multiple defects. You can have a defect on the facial as well as the lingual, and then you would just take two measurements. But it's the sum of the defect, 360 minus the sum of the defects. And then we just plug the numbers into our our worksheet. Uh, here is the root length, the highest vertical bone height, the lowest vertical bone height. The partial bone zone is uh, is just the the highest vertical bone height minus the lowest vertical bone height divided by the root length. And that's 34%. That 34% is right here. The degrees of defect were 51, which leaves 80 86% of the root of circumference at that slice is covered with bone. And then the partial bone zone is the 86% times the percentage of the root that's considered to be in the partial bone zone range. And that comes up to, you multiply 86% times 34.34%. So 29% of that partial bone zone is covered with bone. And then we add the full bone zone of 62% plus the partial bone zone of 29% and we get 91%. So based on this formula, 91% of that first bicuspid is root is covered with bone around the circumference. Like I said, there are definite weaknesses associated with this method of measuring. But I think the, the main thing that this does it it gets it forces you to think in 3d and look at all three planes of space but it does give you uh, a relative measurement when you're comparing different teeth you know i i compare it to a tooth that you see clinically that's bombed out and say you're going to extract the first four bicuspids 
you have a second bicuspid has gross caries and be a very difficult to restore. You can see that clinically. So you would probably opt to take the second bicuspid that's bombed out versus the virgin first bicuspid in most cases. Well, it's the same thing with cone beam CT. You can see the relative amount of bone coverage for uh, a tooth and then make a, it helps make a clinical decision whether strategically it's better to pull out one tooth than another. This is a case that's 25 years post-treatment. Uh, she came in because she had a broken uh, lingual fixed retainer. This is more of an acute um, boundary violation where the lower incisors push through the limit of the cortical plate. The reason I know it's acute is because there has been no significant resorption of the lingual bone. Normally, after, over time, this lingual bone would, would resorb and tightly adapt to the lingual of that root. When you look at the axial view of this tooth, you get a different perspective. You can see that there's clearly a, a dehiscence of that root through the cortical plate, but you can see that there's decent bones surrounding most of the root of that tooth. So when you do the numbers, you find out that that tooth actually has a 70% total root bone coverage. And I can tell you that the tooth is not mobile and that the tooth has good tissue around it. And this may be uh, uh, part of the explanation why you don't have more clinical manifestations of a tooth that looks like it's pushed through the bone. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you found this uh, talk informative. If you have any questions or any comments, you can email me at ortho606 at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. Have a good day.